Welcome back to In the Moment. I'm Lori Walsh. The last couple of years, we've seen an increase in investigations of recorded and unrecorded archaeological sites identified as bison kill sites in the state. Well, this Sunday at 2 p.m. inside the Froyland Science Complex at the University of South Dakota, you can attend the 37th annual Third Sunday Archaeology Lecture Series as it continues. This time, Michael Fosha, the Assistant State Archaeologist with the State Archaeological Research Center in Rapid City, will present on the topic, and he's joining us now from the Black Hills Surgical Hospital Studio and SDPB's Rapid City Studio. Michael Fosho, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. And joining us in the Kirby Family Studio in Sioux Falls, we have Adrian Hannes. He's a professor of anthropology and director of the archaeology lab at Augustana University. Adrian, nice to see you. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to start with you, Adrian, and tell us a little bit just uh, for folks who don't know about this series, a little bit about the lecture series in general, and then we'll dive into this topic. Yeah, good. Well, so as you indicated, this is our 37th year for sponsoring this series, and I guess that we keep thinking that the months of January, February, March are potentially somewhat gloomy. And so looking for some way to oh, change the gloom, we decided that Sunday afternoons would be a good time to try to get folks out for various presentations. Most of them have tended over the years to be focused on archaeology, but there are some that have, you know, drifted into ethnography and so on. So, um, the series, and we have tried very hard over the many years to not have too many cancellations. So I will take this time to apologize to folks for the fact that we had to cancel this January's, but the weather, weather. really. You just never you, know. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk to Michael Fosch if you want to get us started about, for, for, for people who don't know what a bison kill site is, first of all, let's put that in context for our listeners, please. Okay, well, what we've been looking at are communal bison kills, and these come in several forms. Uh, we have ambush sites, we have traps, and we have bison jumps, which is probably the most popular and visible in people's minds. Uh, so, but the one thing we are looking at is the fact that they are communal bison kills and not individual events and not locations where they're just processing but the actual kill event itself all right so the numbers are increasing of, of location of these adrian do you want to address that a little bit in the broader scope of finding things in 2020 that happened you know years centuries even ago well and i guess that as additional work goes on on these landscapes that up here in the dakotas and the northern plains generally these landscapes have not been surveyed as extensively as in other parts of the United States. And so one of the phenomena that exists here is that bison become more and more prominent on the landscapes as the climates change over the last 10 to 12,000 years. So we have ultimately coming into even to the almost modern times, huge herds, I mean, of millions of animals. I think that the calculation sometime in the early 1870s, there might have been 30 million animals out here on the northern plains. So these were certainly creatures that the prehistoric groups pursued. They were an important source of not only food, but clothing and so on. But the techniques of killing were honed and changed. And so I think what Mike is going to be talking about here, and he can correct me, is, you know, looking at these as communal events, how did the technology shift over time? Did it become more effective, less effective, et cetera? So interesting. Mike, yeah, give us a little preview of, of Sunday's lecture. Um, take us to that place. All right. Well, uh, in the last few years, we've been reinvestigating or investigating some bison kill sites. Um, majority of these have been in western South Dakota, but there's also been some in eastern South Dakota we're looking at. And we're trying to, like Adrian uh, discussed, looked at, look at patterns through time in prehistory. And, you know, did one, during one period of time, were they using more natural traps or was it more ambush style hunting? And uh, 
when we see things that are out of the ordinary, we get to ask ourselves, well, why did they change back to something else or why didn't they do it this way? So I'm going to be discussing several of the sites we've been working on uh, to put on a National Register of Historic Places um, and just take them through how we excavated them, what we learned from each site, and future directions for each site. All right, let's talk a little bit about that. Where are we Where are we speaking of, by the way? Is there a site that we can be specific about um, to sort of uh, spin this story out a little further? All right, well, sure. Um, there's, right now, there's 22 sites recorded as bison kills. Um, the ones we've looked at so far, about half of them, we can say, yes, these are bison kills. Uh, there's a good percentage of these sites that no longer exist just because of erosional practices and things like that. Um, but the majority, they seem to cluster a lot in Harding County. And one of the reasons for that is the erosional nature of those sediments there that are exposing and destroying at the same time these bison kill sites. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the sites I'm going to be talking about are in Harding County, uh, but I will be discussing one in the Ree Hills as well. Adrian, talk a little bit about that exposing and destroying at the same time. This is a <laughs> right. Yeah, it's one of the great conundrums of uh, anthropology and archaeology. I guess the landscapes are shifting continuously. I mean, landscapes are dynamic, and there certainly are different sediments that are more prone to the effects of wind and water and so forth, as far as erosion. So, as Mike was saying, there are some of the zones in the state are more susceptible to these exposures being caused by the natural processes of, you know, wind and water erosion. Certainly, um, farming is another aspect in probably coming more to the eastern part of the state as landscapes are farmed, you know, the, the various processes again cause certain levels of erosion. And in a lot of cases, in the past, I think these situations where you have a bone bed, which represents a kill, have not necessarily been recognized as something that was a prehistoric event. Many times people think, well, I mean, I've had people come in and say, here's some bones I found. These are probably cows. And, you know, you examine them for a while and you say, well, no, they're not actually modern cattle. They're actually bison. And then, of course, you get into the debate about, well, you know, what kind of an exposure do you have? And uh, frequently, you'll find these on creek drainage systems and so on. And certainly when we've had some of the heavy flooding in the last several years, the back cutting of bank areas and so on has intensified. So again, where you go through sort of cycles of exposures, and then these things can also be reburied by the same processes that are exposing them. So, And we probably have more eyes out on the landscapes these days than we used to have, not as professional archaeologists, but as avocational collectors and so on. And so we constantly try to encourage people, if they see something, to instead of doing anything about it, like starting to dig it out, actually try to contact us, because if it is indeed a human event, in other words, not a natural die-off of these animals, but something that was caused by human activity, a lot of evidence can be pretty easily destroyed pretty quickly, mm -hmm. you know, through the process of just collecting the bones or something. So um, so I guess that we, we have a active uh, archaeological society in the state, and I think over the years, for instance, these lectures on Sunday are meant to encourage people, you know, to get in touch with us and share this information with us. And, mm. and we certainly appreciate that and try to then become engaged in investigating okay. some of these localities. And, Mike, the science itself is, is fascinating. The process is fascinating. But through, through the process of talking <clears throat> to people about what's happening right here in South Dakota and Harding County, for example, it also opens up this word, world to sort of rethink our own uh, you know, our own humanity and our own history and uh, sort of open doors for people in new ways as they can, even if they're not uh, wanting to go out into the field and do a little archaeology on their own. 
Well, that's, that's true. One of the things I really enjoy about working with the public, with the Archaeological Society, is giving them the in, some small measure of insight into uh, past human events and the people that caused these events. For instance, uh, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people have been hunting bison on the plains. And it's not something that they have to reinvent the wheel every time. They have a strong knowledge of the bison. They know exactly how the bison herds are going to break up into male herds or communal herds, what time of year, when is the best time to take bison for their higher levels of fat, and uh, you know, get them thinking about exactly what would all go into a successful communal bison kill. Yeah, and, and this idea of setting a, a trap or, or uh, you know, uh, what did you say, a, a jump, um, and then the processing that happens after that, if you have multiple uh, bison there to process, it just kind of blows my mind. Uh, Adrian, speak a little bit about the technologies that these people really had created to not only understand what they need to do, where they needed to do it, uh, but how they needed to do it so that it was useful for their community. Yeah, well, in the first place, it's 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 as part of this whole set of discussions, it's calling attention to the fact that the, the peoples in the past had a very intimate knowledge, not only of the habits of the animals they were hunting, of the climates in which they were working, but also the landscapes themselves become a tool. In other words, the landscape is configured in ways that the people understood, and hunting bison for instance, we talk about bison jumps. It's a very complicated process because the animals have to be gradually, gradually, gradually moved into a position that ultimately allows the group of hunters to push them forward because they're not normally going to go over cliff sides and so on. So it, it's something that it was a very, and they created, uh, for instance, sort of a funnel-like of rocks and bushes and so on, which you know would channelize the animals. So the landscapes themselves were reworked in part to create these systems. And there's some huge sites, for instance, um, up in Canada, we have a number of very important sites that probably were used over five or 6,000 years of time where people continued to come back and come back and come back. Well, then when you talk about a group of animals going over, let's say, a jump. Once they start over the jump, you're not going to step out in front of them and stop them, or you'll become part of the event <laughs> yourself. So in some instances, more animals went over these jumps than would actually be able to be dealt with in the butchering process. In other words, uh, it depended, again, on the time of the year, in some cases, groups in the fall of the year going into the early winter maybe could live around the kill site itself or near where they pulled some of the animals. But you have to realize that these animals, each animal probably is 1,500 or more pounds in weight. Wow. And we did an experimental butchering some years ago out in the Black Hills with stone tools. We, extraordinarily efficient but it was very, I mean, I was working with uh, Dr. George Frizen from the University of Wyoming at that time, who has spent his life studying these kind of sites. And he says, well, here, grab, grab these you know, legs of the animal and we'll flip it over so we can cut through the stomach area. And nothing like grabbing 1,200 pounds of dead weight. I mean, I was, <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> I and about six other people sort of gradually tipped this animal over. So it was something that took a lot of very intense physical activity coupled with a very deep knowledge that the people had of animal anatomy, right. the habits of the animals, the climates in which they were you know, moving around and so on. So as Mike said, it, there are times of the year that you would hunt them. There are times of the year that you really wouldn't hunt them just because of the herd habits themselves. 
This lecture is Sunday at 2 inside the Forleyan Science Complex. That's room uh, 113A at Augustana University as part of this Sunday archaeology lecture series. Mike Fascia has the, been with us. He's the assistant state archaeologist with the State Archaeological Research Center in Rapid and uh, Adrian Hannes with the uh, archaeology lab at Augustana University. Thank you both so much for being here with us and telling us just a tiny bit of this story. Please come back again. Thank you. Thank you.